All right, I think we're ready to start. Can everybody hear me? Everybody, I'm trying to check to see if everybody in the room can hear me because I'm not going to project like I usually do in a classroom. If I project, is that okay, Hector? Is the sound okay? All right, good. So we're ready to start. Everybody's ready to start studying for final exams, right? Yes, if you have questions, Deanna's monitoring the room. You can give your questions to Deanna. She'll make sure I get them up here. Um, otherwise, you guys are you just you're free to follow along. Maybe. There we go. Okay, question one. Linear inequalities graph the following on a number line. So we have three x. Is my pen gonna work? 3x is less than or equal to negative 6. All right, I really want you guys to help me here. Am I going to solve this inequality any differently from an equation? No. Maybe. Is it any different from an equation? If I had the same equation over here, 3x equals negative 6, would I do, would I, would I proceed to solve the same way? Yes, okay. The rules are the same, whether you have an equation or an inequality, except the one extra rule. What's that one extra rule, guys? If you, if you multiply or divide by a negative, you have to flip this inequality sign. So, if I'm solving for x here, I don't like this color. I really don't like this color. Here we go. I like blue. All right, if I'm trying to solve for x, I want to isolate x, I need to undo this multiplication. How do I do that? Divide 3. I divide both sides by 3. Do I need to flip the number? No. Because what's not negative? Because I did not divide by a negative, I don't need to flip the symbol. So we still have less than or equal to. These reduce. I have x is less than or equal to. Negative 6 divided by 3 is negative 2. All right, let's graph on a number line. Let's graph on a number line. What's the important number here? Negative 2. So is it open or closed? It's closed because it has the equal sign. So you can either fill this circle in for closed, or what else can you use for closed? Brackets. I'm not going to put the brackets on yet. Well, maybe I will. I think they're going to go this way, aren't they? X is less than negative 2. So which numbers are less, left or right? Are you sleeping, Kenneth? <laughs> left. These numbers are less. So this is what you need to shade. And you're going to shade all the way to negative infinity. All right. The question doesn't ask us to write interval notation, but sometimes you have to. So you guys help me with the interval notation. Where does the shading start? Negative infinity. Good. Where does the shading end? Negative 2. Brackets or parentheses around infinity? Always parentheses around infinity. What about this negative 2? Brackets because the negative 2 is closed. The negative 2 is closed because of the equal signs. It's the negative 2. I'm sorry, my negative symbol got incorporated into the... It's, it's to the left of 0. It has to be negative 2. Positive 2 would be... Hector? Hector's giving me a hard time. All right, are we ready? For, does it, are there any questions? We are ready for the next one? All right, we're just getting warmed up. Um, there's nothing here, Deanna. Oh, you can't look at your paper. Okay, put your papers down. How many questions are on your final exam? 40, 400, or 40? 40, good. Is my final multiple choice or fill in the blanks? Oh, yeah, you're right. In fact, multiple choice, there's, ones, there's matching, and there's those all ever popular choose all the correct answers. Don't you guys like those ones with the little check boxes? Yeah, those are my favorite. No, you don't like <laughs> What sections does my final exam cover? What section in the book does the final exam cover? All. That was section one, chapter one through six. Good. Where are you going to take your final exam? And when? Okay. Yes, you're right. You're with your professor, aren't you? You should be with your professor, and your, your professor should have given you a room number and a time for your final exam. Are there any questions about that 
in the room. Everybody talk to their professor about this already. Okay, good. How much time do you have for this exam? This is time for two hours. That's not two hours and one minute. If you show up 10 minutes late to your exam, that's 10 minutes off your exam time. All right, because the room is booked solid. Two hours. How many attempts do you have to pass this exam? <laughs> one. <laughs> Kenan, I love you, Kenan. <laughs> what is the minimum score I can get to still pass the course? This is a trick question, isn't it? Yeah. This all depends, doesn't it? What does this depend on? Do you have the competency check hundreds? Do you have those? If you have the competency check hundreds, then there's no minimum score on your final exam, is there? If you don't have the hundreds on your competency checks, what do you need to get? 70%, good. That's not the only qualification, though. I think we're going to talk about some other stuff later, though. <gasps> Here we go. Let's solve. What's the first thing you guys notice when you look at this question? The, des the decimals, the parentheses, all of that stuff is interesting stuff. I don't really like to work with a lot of decimals. I would like to clear these decimals out. Does anybody remember how to clear out the decimals? You're going to move the decimal. That's right. Which ones are we going to look at to move the decimal? This one and this one. What's in the parentheses here doesn't matter because eventually it's just going to get multiplied times what's out here. So to clear these decimals, I need to move the decimal how many places? Two places. So that's going to make this 0 0.9 turn into 90. If you move the decimal two places, that turns into 90. This one we're not changing in the parentheses because we changed the 90 outside. We don't need to change anything that 90 is being multiplied by. If I move this two places, I end up with 536. All right, now what should I do? Good, we're going to distribute this 90. So you guys are going to have to help me out here because I don't feel like I'm moving this out. What is 90 times 4.7? <laughs> no calculators. Come on. Can you move the decimal and then put it back? Yeah. I think that if you just multiply it out, it'll be faster than thinking about whether you need to move the decimal or not. Don't forget the x here, because this is 90 times 4.7x. And 90 times negative 3 is what? Negative 270. Good equals 536. And see, decimals are gone. So what's the next step? Good. Let's do 70. So those will cancel. So we have 423x equals, what's 536 plus 270? 806. 806. Good. Last step. Divide by 420. Oops, I put a decimal there. Shouldn't have done that. Where's the eraser? Do I have an eraser down here? Where is it? Eraser. Thank you. No decimal there. Okay. 520. 523. 423. All right. So what is x equal? Did you guys divide this while I was trying to erase that? No? Nobody, everybody's too lazy to divide it out. I'm not doing it for you. Okay, Kenneth, one po point not zero. I have point nine one. Is it oh nine? Andrea? I do know this doesn't come out even. I do know this doesn't come out even. Oh, come on, you guys. This only goes in one time. Oh, I wrote it wrong then. Okay. So let me erase this again. Okay. So you guys got it for me. It's 1.19. One, one, one,
I did have it right the first time. Thank you. Okay, so let's do this. Since I'm a little trouble with this, go ahead and review this. All right, 423 goes into 806 one time. One times 423, and when I, re when I subtract this, what do I end up with here? 383. Okay, I've got to put a decimal here because that's the end of my whole number. So that goes up there and the answer up there too. And then I can drop down a zero. So now I have 3,830. Uh, so this is a nine. Okay, so what's nine times 423, you guys? 3817. And then when you subtract, what do you have? 13. And then you bring down, and this doesn't go. So you're right, this is a zero here, isn't it? So if we're rounding this, this is what it's going to round to. Usually we round to two decimal places. I would say that this is particularly difficult because on your final exam, this division will come out exact. You won't have to round. If you do have to round, the directions will specifically say round to two decimals or round to one decimal or round to the nearest whole number. So if you need to round, the directions will tell you to round. Are we good? So I guess we're done. No? Oh, here's some more questions. Will I, no looking at your paper. Will I pass if I have a B in my class, 100% on all the competency checks, and a 65% on the final exam? Yes, yes. Now be aware, the 65% on the final exam is not going to help your grade, is it? This final exam counts for 25% of your class grade. So this B is going to be affected by this 65%, isn't it? Yeah. If you have a high B, it might not hurt you too much. If you have a low B, right at an 80%, this, this will drop you down to a C. So be aware that even if you have all these 100 percents and you have a good grade in your class, that the final exam still counts for 25% of your grade. And it will affect your grade. So don't blow it off. But you guys are good students, right? Yes. <laughs> this is going to take six hours to get through. Okay, linear equations and applications. That's a really nice name for what? Word problems. There we go. Bear sells paint for $15 per gallon. It will cost Dan $345 to paint his entire house. If each gallon covers 230 square feet, how many square feet is Dan's house? This sounds really confusing, doesn't it? So we're going to break it apart little by little. Bear sells paint, 15, so I'm going to draw a picture of a paint can because you have to have a picture. There you go. There's a paint can. Each paint can costs $15. It will cost Dan $345 to paint the whole house, right? And that costs $345. So what do you guys think about that, that information? If you divide, what, is, what information is that going to tell you? What, 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 what information are you going to get from dividing? You're right, we are going to divide, but what is that going to tell you then? How many paint cans? Good. How many cans of paint do I need? How many cans of paint? So you guys divide that out for me. How many cans of paint did, did Dan use? Or did he buy? 23? Somebody's got it for me? Was that Andrea? 23. Okay, 23 cans of paint. Are we all cool with that? That sounds reasonable for an entire house, 23 cans of paint. What's the rest? If each gallon, that's a can, there's 230 square feet, how many square feet is the house? So each can covers 230 square feet, doesn't it? I have 23 cans. La la la, can I draw 23 cans? Okay, I have 23 cans. <laughs> Each one covers 230 square feet. Do you guys understand that? So, oh, you're right. We have to multiply the point. 230 for each one can times we bought 23 cans will tell us the total amount of square feet, won't it? So I think you guys can multiply that out for me. Okay. I got 5,200 
90. Did everybody get 5,290? That's a decent sized house. Are we good? All right. Oh, what? That's the answer. Do we need to go back? The, the question is how many square feet is Dan's house? Did you guys figure that out? You figured out how many square feet he was covering with all that paint, didn't you? Are we clear? All right. So this one's blank. So what does that tell you? There must be some kind of question here. Will I pass if I have a B in my class? A B is a good grade, right? And 100% on almost all the competency checks. Okay, now we're talking about, you still can't pass, can't you? If what? If you get a what on the exam? If you get the 70% on the final, right? I think it's 28 out of 40. Am I right? That's 70%. 28 out of 40. So are we right? No? Not by this information, what well, we added the extra information on. So you will only pass then if you get the 70% or 28 out of 40 on the final exam. Here's another fun application. All right. Hector and Vicky went to T-Bones for all-you-can-eat shrimp. Yeah, okay, that's highly unlikely. <laughs> We went to T-Bones for shrimp. Okay. All right. Vicky picked up the bill, which is also highly unlikely, <laughs> which totaled $30. She left three fifteen dollars for the tip. What percentage of the bill was the tip? I know I'm cheap. I'm cheap. <laughs> how are we going to figure that out? Anybody have any idea how to figure this one out? Oh, okay. There we go. Let's figure it out like a proportion. Is, what was that again? Is over of equals the percent over 100. What does that mean? Is over of? Well, I got the percent part, but you guys have to figure out which one is the is and which one is the of, don't you? The is is always the part, the 315. The of is the 30. That's what you're trying to figure out. 315 is what percent of 30? Isn't that what you're trying to figure out? 315 is, I'm going to write it right here. 315 is what percent of 30? And if you, you know what? If you write it out in a sentence like this, especially if you're going to do the is and the of thing, this sentence will help you determine which one is is and which one is up. So we don't know what the percent is. That's what we're trying to find. So the percent out of 100. How do we solve a proportion like this? Cross multiply. I always like to start with a variable. You don't have to, but I like to start with a variable. So we're going to have 30 times x equals 315 times 100. That's right, 315 times 100. It's 315, isn't it? Equals 30x. Now what? Divide by 30. So there we have that fun division again, don't we? Yeah? All right, how many 30s are in 31? One. And then we have one left. We bring down the five. How many 30s are in 15? Can we erase that part? <laughs> How many 30s are in 15? None. Good. All right. So 0 times 30 is 0. So we still have this 15. And then we have 0 down. So how many 30s are in 150? 5. Don't forget to bring this decimal up into your answer. All right. So 5 times 30. So we have no leftovers now. So we're done with our division. But what does that mean? X equals 10.5. What percent of the bill was the tip? You could express this as 10.5% or 10.5%. You mean the same thing? Does that make sense to you guys? 
Yeah, what's 10% of 30? Three dollars. So is this, is this reasonable that this would be ten and a half percent? It is reasonable. With your word problems, Joy, look at your answer at the end. Is it a reasonable answer for the question I'm trying to figure out? If I got something crazy out here like three hundred and twelve percent, that wouldn't make sense, would it? You would know that you made a mistake. So you should always check back to see if your answer is reasonable. Do we have another question here? Oh. We have another word problem that's not in your book. Okay, so I'm going to try to write it up here for you guys. If Indiana invests $10,000 at 2.75% for four years, How much interest will she earn? What kind of question is this, you guys? This is a simple interest question, isn't it? The formula for simple interest is I equals PRT. This is not a hard formula to memorize. What's hard about it is figuring out where the numbers go in the formula. So let's see if we can figure it out. If Deanna's investing $10,000, where does that fit into the formula? $10,000 is the principal. That's usually the, the big amount that you invest or you take a loan on is the principal. So we're going to put $10,000 here instead of P. 2.75% is what? The rate. The rate is always in a percent. The rate is always in a percent. So we have 2.75, but when we put percents into formulas, what do you have to do to them? Which is it? Multiply or divide by 100? <laughs> you guys are crazy. All right, look, this means parts out of 100, doesn't it? This means 2.75 parts out of 100. That means divided by 100. If you were going to write it as a fraction, the 100 would be on the bottom. So this is divided by, so we have to turn this to a decimal by moving this plus 0.0275. So nice of you guys to give me nice round even numbers. Okay, where does the 4 go? That's a time. For this formula, time is always in years. So the 4 goes back there. So the only thing we're missing is interest. Does that match the question? How much interest? So that's what you're looking for. So what should you do here? Multiply. What are you going to multiply first? Does it even matter what you multiply first? It doesn't matter because multiplication is what? Commutative. I, I really need to stand up. Multiplication is commutative, so it doesn't matter what order you multiply them in. I think it would be nice to multiply that, that crazy decimal times 10,000, wouldn't it? What's going to happen when I multiply 0 0.275 times 10,000? The decimal is going to move four places, isn't it? And I'm going to end up with 275 times 4. Everybody follow that? So you guys figured out, what's 275 times 4? Nobody knows. How, how much? 1,100? Is that reasonable? Forget the 75. Actually, this is close to 300, isn't it? 300 times 4 would be 1,200, right? So that makes sense. That's reasonable. Are we good? I need a unit on here. What's the units? Dollars. Good. Yay. Will I pass? W? E. Will I pass if I have a C in my class? <sighs> well, there's stuff missing here, isn't there? You have to have a C in your class and something else and something else or something else, right? So if you only have a C in your class, are you going to pass? No. No. Okay, graphs. Find the slope of the line that passes through these points. 
How do we find the slope of a line when we know two points? It has to do with rise over run, but there's a special way to do it. What do we call that? The slope, the slope formula. I'm waiting for somebody to help me out here. Y2 minus y. Oh, the lights go on. <laughs> over what? Thank you. X2 minus X1. And these ones and twos are exponents, right, guys? Are those exponents? No, no, why not? How do you know they're not exponents? T Don't tell them the answer. <laughs> How do you know these aren't exponents, you guys? They're, they're down at the bottom instead of up at the top, aren't they? All right. So what does this mean, y2 minus y1? you got to subtract, but what am I subtracting? <laughs> you, have, you have to mark these points, don't you? This is x1. It just means this is the first x-coordinate. This is y1. This is x2, and this is y2. Now you can fit them in. So y2 minus y1 will be 4 minus negative 2. And x2 minus x1 will be a negative 7 minus 5. Everybody follow that? Why do I have these two negatives here? Where are they coming from? Where does this negative? This, this one is part of the formula, isn't it? Where does this negative come from? Yeah, it was right here. So be careful when you have negatives on these coordinates that you don't mix up and end up having less than you should. Sometimes you end up with these two negatives. So now we're going to simplify. Can I cancel these two negatives? Yeah, 4 plus 2 is 6. Negative 7 minus 5. Now we're going to simplify. Negative what? Negative 1 half. All right, negative 1 half. What does a slope of negative 1 half look like? Does so it go uphill or downhill? Why does it go downhill? Because it's negative. Is it steep or is it shallow? Ben? It's shallow. Why is this shallow? It's less than 1. A slope of 1 is a, is a 45 degree angle. So anything less than 1 is getting kind of shallow. Good, good. So this is kind of like this. I like to draw little sketches. It kind of helps if you have to pick this out from a graph, if you know from the slope what this line should kind of look like. The slope is not just an arbitrary number. It really determines what the line looks like, which direction it's going, whether it's deep, whether it's shallow. So it has some, a lot of meaning. Okay, do we have another funny question? No. Okay, determine the slope of the line represented by this equation. Can we use the slope formula? that we used on the last one? No, why not? We don't know any of the points, do we? So how are we going to determine the slope of the line for this, this equation? Put it in slope intercepts form. Good. And slope intercept form says what? Y equals mx plus b. So we need to solve this equation for y. Right now it says x minus y equals 7. What's the first step? Solve this equation for y. Okay, this x needs to be on the other side, so you're going to subtract it. So now I have negative y equals negative x plus 7. Why didn't I write that as 7x? I'm not multiplying. Good. Can I put these two together? No, why not? They're not something. They're not like terms. You guys are ready for this exam. Good. So am I done now? No. What's wrong? We have to get rid of negative on this y because we want positive. So we're going to divide by the negative 1, but you got to do that on every term. You're dividing by negative 1. So this turns into positive y equals. So what is this going to be now in front of x? This is a negative 1 divided by a negative 1 makes positive 1. Good. Do I need to write the 1? And then this is minus 7, isn't it? So we did all that to find out what? The slope of the line. Where is the slope of the line? 
it's always the coefficient of x, but there's nothing there. What does that mean? It's the invisible one. So this slope is one. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm going to ask again, is that uphill or downhill? It's uphill because it's positive. Is it steep or shallow? This slope of 1 is a 45 degree angle, isn't it? So it's right between steep and shallow. Anything more than 1 is getting steep. Anything less than 1, that's kind of an interpretation of what steep is, but a slope of 1 is a 45 degree angle. Good. Any questions? Are we all good? We're all good. I wish I could walk around, but I'm kind of tied to the computer here. All right, determine the x and y intercepts of the line represented by this equation. What do we know about the x and y intercepts? All right, the x and y intercepts are all about the zeros because this is where the graph, the line will cross the axes. And one of the coordinates is always zero on the axes. Okay, so let's talk about the x intercept first. The x intercept is an ordered pair coordinates. And there's always a zero for what? For the y. So if we want to know what the x coordinate is, we plug in zero for y. And that's going to give us negative 2 times 0 equals 6 minus 2x. All we did is plug in 0 for y because at the x intercept, the y coordinate is always 0. Well, what happens here, guys? Negative 2 times 0 is 0. So you're just going to keep simplifying, solving for x here. What's the next step? Subtract the 6. Subtract the 6. So we have negative 6 equals negative 2x. You guys all with me? What's the next step? Divide by 2. Negative 2. So what is it? Positive 3. Okay, so this is the x-coordinate for the x-intercept. We're going to do the same thing for the y-intercept, except now, where's the 0? For the y-intercept, which coordinate is 0? The x-coordinate is 0. So now we're going to plug in 0 for x. We're going to do the whole thing again. So we have negative 2y equals 6 minus 2 times 0. And we'll solve y this time. So I'm still simplifying. What is negative 2 times 0? Zero? 0. Do I even need this term here? No, this term is turned to 0. So last step, divide by negative 2. So y equals negative 3. There we go. The x and y intercepts are ordered pairs. If you can remember that the intercepts are all about the zeros, you have to plug 0 in. The x-intercept has a 0 for the y-coordinate. The y-intercept has a 0 for the x-coordinate. Are we good? Uh, I love these questions. Will I ask if I have an A in my class and a 75% on the final exam? Do you need anything else? Do you need anything else? What about the competency checks? If you get over a 70, it doesn't matter whether you have the hundreds on the competency test. So this is a good pass scenario. Yay, you guys all have A's in your classes, right? No? Okay. Well, we won't talk anymore about that. Can I go on to polynomials? All right, here we go. This is exponents and polynomials. So you guys look at this. Tell me what kind of a polynomial this is. This is a trinomial. Excellent. Trinomial. And what about this one? Also a trinomial. Why? It has three terms. And what separates the terms? The minus and but the plus and minus signs right here are what's separating the terms, right? That's what makes this one, two, three terms. And this one is one, two, three terms. So this is a trinomial. What's the operation here? Subtraction. So you're right. It's subtraction. The negative sign and the subtraction are the same thing. How do we go about subtracting these two trinomials? It's got to do with like terms. We, we're going to combine like terms, but first we have to distribute something. The negative sign. 
Yeah, this has the invisible one. Are you guys used to writing the invisible one here? Yeah, and then you're going to distribute, but only back here, not in front. So this first trinomial is the same. No changes. The second trinomial is going to get this negative sign distributed on it. So we're going to have negative 2x squared. Then what? Negative 15x plus 10. All right, good. That's the first step. Now we have to do what? Combine the like terms. I would do this in descending order. So you're going to look for the highest exponents first. Which ones are they? The 3x squared and the negative 2x squared. And when I put them together, what does that make? Just 1x squared. Good. Then what? Negative 4x and negative 15x make what? Negative 19x. All right, that leaves with 15 and 10. Are they like terms? So what does that make? Plus 25. Excellent. And what kind of polynomial do I have at the end? Another trinomial. Good. Excellent. All right. Um, do I have a blank slide here? Use a W. I'm going to erase. Did everybody get this? Okay. I've got this question here. This is not in your book. But you guys can write this one down. Negative 2A times a squared minus 7a plus 5 minus a squared. And the directions here would be what? Anybody know what the directions would be? Simplify. Good. Is this an equation or an expression? How do you know? There's no equal sign. We simplify expressions. So what do you guys think the first step will be here? You know what? Before you distribute, you really should look in here, in the parentheses, shouldn't you? There might be like terms in here. In this case, there aren't any. But sometimes there are like terms inside the parentheses. And if we follow order of operations, we should always simplify in parentheses first, shouldn't we? So in this case, there aren't any, but in some cases, there are like terms in the parentheses. It's going to make your distributing faster and easier if you go ahead and combine like terms in parentheses first before you distribute, but there aren't any here. So now we can go to distribute. What am I distributing? Why? You're right. Why am I going to distribute the negative 2a but not this negative a squared? That's right. This subtraction sign right here is telling me that this is not multiplication, is it? This is a subtraction because there's a sign. There's no sign between this term and the parentheses. So this is telling me it's multiplication. Okay, okay, in the room the question is what if there were no subtraction sign? If this a squared were right next to this parentheses, it would be multiplied. And you would, you could either distribute this or distribute this, but you would not need to distribute both. You would do one at a time. Or, or you could also bring this to the front and multiply at times what, were in the, what was in the front before you distributed times the parentheses, which is what I usually do. And then I only have to distribute one time. But that's, there's no negative sign here, which means that this a squared would be times. I can. I can. Um, let me let me rewrite this original original expression here first. All right, you guys help me out. We're going to distribute. So what is this going to make? Negative two a what? Cubed because we add the exponents. Then is it positive or negative? Positive fourteen a squared. Good. And then what? Negative 10a. And then this negative a squared here is just tacking right onto the end. You guys all follow that? Now you're looking for like terms starting with the highest exponent so that we can write them in descending order. Uh, this a cubed doesn't have anything to combine with. So this is the first term, negative 2a cubed. We have two a squared terms. This is a positive 14 and a negative 1, isn't it? So what does that make? Good. And that just leaves this negative 10a. All right. So this is good. With a negative a squared being subtracted. If we want to do this with negative a squared being multiplied, 
I'm going to rewrite it because it's a totally different expression, isn't it? All right, I dropped the negative here. Can you guys see the difference? With this a squared right next to the parentheses, it means multiply. You have a multiply and a multiply and a multiply. I would, this is the easiest way, because multiplication is commutative, you can move this factor around. I will bring one by the front. This is how I do this. Negative 2a, so that would be negative 2a times the a squared that I brought from the back times the trinomial that's in the parentheses. You guys follow that? It's, it, it's not going to be the same answer as this. It's not going to be the same answer because we changed the expression, didn't we? So what is negative 2a times a squared times b? Right, negative 2a cubed. Then you have the trinomial here. So what should you do now? Now you should distribute. So now we're going to distribute this, and what's it going to come out to be? Negative 2a i, right. Then what? Positive 14a to the 4, and then what? Negative 10a cubed. Do you see that it does not be totally different expression? depending on whether that you have a subtraction symbol here or not. So this is definitely subtract. And see, when you can tell this is multiply because the variable's right next to the parentheses. There's no symbol between them. Or with this symbol here, this means subtract. Are we good? All right. Let's see what's next. We did this one already. It looks like we did this one already. <laughs> I'm starting to get a little confused now which ones we did and which ones we didn't. We didn't do this one yet. So, can you guys tell me what kind of polynomial is this? This is a binomial, but because it has two what? Two terms. Two terms. And what kind of tri a polynomial is this? Also a binomial. Good. How, uh, what's the operation here? Boil is an operation, it's an acronym. <laughs> Good. This is multiplication. This is multiplication. You can use FOIL to help you with multiplication of a binomial times a binomial. I don't call this FOIL. I don't call this FOIL. That's a new term. We, when I was in school, there was no such thing as FOIL. We called this double distributive, which is what it is. You can, you're going to distribute the 10x squared to this binomial back here. And what is that going to give you when you distribute the 10x squared? 70x to the fourth, because you add the exponents. And then minus, what, 10x cubed. Then you're going to distribute 2x back here. And what's that going to give you? Plus 14x, what, cubed, because you're adding the exponents still. And then 2x times negative x gives you... Is Positive or negative? Negative 2x squared. The next step is to combine the like terms. Generally, they're in the middle. That's not always the case, but generally they're in the middle. So x to the fourth. When I combine the negative 10x cubed with the positive 14x cubed, I get positive 4x cubed, and then I have the negative 2x squared. Any questions? Yay! We have a big white space. Will I pass if? Will I pass if? I have a B in my class and a 70% on all the competency checks. Don't you wish? Why, what's wrong with this scenario? You supposed to get 70% checks? What are you supposed to have on these? 100. Okay, so is this going to be a yes or a no? This is a no. No. Now, in the case that you get a 70% on the final exam, will you be okay? Yeah, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. Exponents and polynomials. All right. Anybody have any idea where we should start here? 
Yeah, you should start with the coefficients, shouldn't you? You have 72 divided by 12. What is 72 divided by 12? 6. Is that 6 going to be on the top of the fraction or the bottom? It's the top. Because it is 6 over 1, it's a whole number 6. 72 divided by 12 is 6. And then what? Then you got the end. You don't, you don't have to move it down, but you can. You can if you want. If you move it down, it's going to become m to the negative 9, isn't it? I, this is the way I look at this. This is like reducing. You got 9m's on the top, right? And you got, oh, now i got to draw 16, don't I? Okay, there's 16 of these. You're right. And then they reduce off, right? They reduce where the leftover is going to be. How many are going to be left over? Because there was seven from this that did reduce. So you can have an M7 on the bottom. That's the way I look at it. But you get the same result by bringing that M9 down. You get the same result. Now, this one's negative up here. I would bring this one down and make it positive, right? When you bring your base, if you move them from top to bottom, the sign on the exponent changes. It's really useful for making po negative exponents into positives. So now what happens with these ends? Do I subtract the, the 7 and the 4? Why do I add them? Because this is multiply. This, this is multiply between these ends. So we have n to the what? 11. Is that it? Is there anything else? That was deceptively short. <laughs> oh, we have a white space. Will I pass if? I have an A in my class. 100% on all the competence. You check. No, I didn't take the final exam. If this is somebody in my class, I will personally come to your house and beat you up. <laughs> what will happen if you don't take the final exam? You get you automatically fail the class. Are we clear on that? There's a big fat no. Okay, factoring. Does anybody does everybody remember that flow chart from factoring? Did you guys all get that in your class? It should be burned into your brain. When you close your eyes, you should see it. Yes. You didn't get the factoring flow chart? Can we get a few in the depot? Somebody wasn't paying attention in classes. Now claiming I mean, not the factoring flow chart. Ooh, what's at the top of that factoring flow chart? Whenever the directions say factor, you should have that flow chart in your brain. At the very top is in descending order. Descending order is kind of a moot point. If there's more than one variable, it isn't going to matter. Okay. What's the next step after descending order? Look for a DCF, which is what this is. This What's the CF of 32 and 64? 32. Good. How many X's are common? There's at least two X's in both of those terms. So X squared is common. Why, common? why not? The Y is only in term. There's no Y in the second term, so it can't be common if it's not in both terms. So this is the GCF. 32 X squared. Anything else with it? What do the directions say? What do the directions say? Did you find the GCF? It doesn't ask you to factor it out, does it? Some of the questions on your competence exam are like What is the GCF? Some of them say factor out the GCF. So, no, it's not. This is what is the GCF. If the if the directions say factor out the GCF. What will we do? First we have to find it, which we did. That's the first step. And you have to do what? You are undoing distributive property to find out what's in parentheses once the GCF factored out and do that by division. So we divide both of these terms by the GCF to find out what's left. So what's left here in the first term when I divide? Just the Y. 
60 divided by 32 is 2, so there's a 2 there. And then x cubed divided by x squared is x. So this is factor out the GCF. Do you guys see the difference? This is just fine. GCF. This is factor out the GCF. Any questions? No? We're good? So we're going to do some more factoring. Ben's happy. We're going to do some factoring. So you guys all have that flow chart in your brain? What's the first step? Make sure that your trinomial is in descending order, your polynomial. What's the second step? Is there anything common here in this trinomial? Is there a GCF? No. Okay. There's no GCF. The third step was what? What? How many terms is this? Is this a trinomial? What kind of trinomial is it? This is a standard trinomial. Why? The lead coefficient. That's what makes this a standard trinomial. Right. So how do we factor standard trinomial? Um, on a trinomial that has a coefficient that's 2, 3, 4, 5, you might use the AC method. All right? This, a standard trinomial, can factor in one step. How do you get x squared? x times x. Bring down the first sign. Positive times negative makes negative, so you have different signs. Different signs mean you're subtracting in the middle. So factors of 30 that subtract to make 13, subtract 15 and 2. That's where the signs are important. It's not 10 and 3. The signs would have to be the same to give you 10 and 3. Hector. Liz. I'll do, I'll do the next one. I'll do the next one. Since we're still factoring. Are we having fun yet? Not really. Wow. What we call this, what, what, this whole entity right here, it, it, the division is indicated. This has a special name. Rational expression. What does the simplify mean? When the directions say simplify a rational expression, what does that mean to you? Let's try and eat a rational expression. It's a rational expression, isn't it? If I ask you to simplify, whoa, if I, that wasn't me. If I ask you to simplify, what would you do? Reduce. How, how? You would divide by a common factor, or you could list with what are the factors here, and you could cancel off the factors that match. That's exactly what we're going to do up here. We're going to find out what are the factors, and then we're going to cancel the factors that match. That's what we do. That's how we reduce fractions, the rational expression. So, we're going to How are we top? So, let me do two, three, and then we square root. Sure, I guess two x times what's first thing. Both signs are negative. We're in the middle. Add five. Three and two. All right, with Colombian But here we have a two common, don't we? So we end up with 2x minus 3 times, when I divide these both by 2, I get x minus 1. 
be the factor of the top. 2x minus 3 times x minus 1. What do you guys think about the bottom, the denominator? There's a subtraction, and then you have a perfect square, and one also a perfect square, isn't it? So when you factor the difference of squares, again, you're going to be binomials. Nope. What's the square root of x squared? x times x. What's the square root of 1? 1 times 1. What do you got? Positive, negative. So what's going to cancel? So what are you, what are you left with? Okay, so I can cancel these x's, right? Can I cancel those those x's? No, why not? Why can't you cancel those x's? Because they're part they're terms. They're part of a binomial. They're terms in the binomial. And when you're canceling, you can only cancel the entire binomial if it's with an identical binomial. So if it doesn't cancel up here, it's not going to cancel down here. All right, we got one more question, and then I think I'm going to turn over to, who am I turning over to? Okay, here we go, one more question. Will I pass if I have a class in the final exam? Why not? Okay, unless, that's right, unless. Unless you have 100% on how many competencies? How many are there? Seven competencies. Okay, so this is probably going to be a no, right? No passing. Liz, you can hear me okay? All right. Well, you guys in the room can you hear me okay? No. <laughs> All right. So we're simplifying radicals in this one. So we're going to so the typical story with these is you simplify the inside of you can and what I like to do is I like to separate these into perfect squares and imperfect squares. So what are some factors of 12? What do you guys think? 4 and 3, 6 and 2, right? Which one of these are perfect squares? 4 and 3. So all I'm doing is I'm separating the 12 out into 4 and 3. And perfect squares can be square rooted. The square root of 4 is 2. That turns into parentheses when you do that. Okay, and then we just mold that out. 4c plus 2 is 8c square root of 3. So that's it for that one. Let's do the one on the right. What do you notice about 144? It's this perfect square, right? The square root. 4 is 12. Do you know how to do the square root of exponents, g squared? The square root of g squared, whenever you have an exponent, all you do is you divide the exponent by the index. And the index here is 2. We don't see it there, but it's 2. So the square root of g squared is just g. And then we multiply that out. So we have 8c square root of 3. 3 times 12 is negative 36, and g times g is g squared. Questions on that one? Can we simplify this anymore? Can we subtract these two? No, why not? Not like that. No questions there? All right, more factoring. Yeah. It's probably just the internet. It's just slow. You use a lot of internet. 
I don't think it goes slow. All right. So we can start canceling B's and C's here, right? No. Why not? What do we have to do with canceling things? Factoring, right? We, have to, we can cancel factors. So if I look at the top here, we always look for greatest common factors first, right? Do I see a greatest common factor up here? Yeah. A, A common to everything. How about B's? How many B's are in common? Two B's in common. Two factors of B in common. So when we take that out, we get B plus A. Everybody with me there? You can verify you're right because if you re redistribute this back in, you get back to the original numerator. Let's look at the denominator. Do we have a GCF in the denominator? What's the a B and a C. Factor of B and C. So when we take those out, we're left with a C, so B plus an A. No guarantees on this straight line. There we go. Do you see any factors in common? A B, right? Because this B squared, you can think of that as B times B. So there's a B in common here. That's it, right? So the numerator is factor of A, factor of B, all over factor of C in the top here. Any questions here? Okay. Subtracting rational expressions. So I get the fun ones. Yay. All right. We need a common denominator, even if there's letters and all that stuff. So this already has a common denominator. We okay with that? Okay. So that means that my answer is going to be over 6x squared y. Now to do the numerator, I need to remember this is a subtraction. Do you guys know what to do with that subtraction? Distribute it out. Good. So we distribute out the negative one. So that's 3x minus 2. We distribute out the negative 1. We get negative x minus 8. What's next? Some like terms, right? We got 3x negative x. Then we have negative 2 and negative 8. That's negative 10. So you think I'm done? Not quite. There's one more thing that we have to do. Remember the last problem we had to reduce? Let me just go back for a minute. You saw we had some things in common here that we had to reduce. We have to do the same thing with this problem now. Can I factor some things out and can I reduce what I factor? So let's look. Yeah. Uh, well, kind of. I can't start canceling here because that 2 and x, that's, those are terms. I need to make them factors. So let's look for a GCF up here. The GCF up here. So when I factor that out, I get x minus 5 all over 6x squared y. Now I can reduce that 2. You see why, right? Because that 2 has now been taken out of that 10. Mm-hmm. So 2 and 6 can be reduced by 2. So we get 1 and 3. So that makes my final answer x minus 5 over 3x squared y. Questions here? We understand that we can't cancel this x, right? Because it's not a factor. Only factors can be canceled. Everybody's writing madly. I must be. Am I talking too fast? No. Good. Not as fast as her. She talks faster. Yeah. All right. We're solving for C1. So we're solving for this variable right here. There's a lot of things going on in this problem. So what I like to do is you see how there's again you identify those factors, those things that are being multiplied. You have this factor right here times a. So my first step is going to be to isolate this factor so I can then deal with the c1. 
So the way I'm going to do that is, you guys know what operation this is between the A and the factor? It's multiplication. So I'm going to do that by dividing both sides by A. That will cancel A with A, because that's 1, right? Leave me with C1 minus C2 over 4. Just like Professor Barnett said, now this is not exponential subjects. C1, C2. Remember, I'm still solving for C1. You get Y divided by A? So you get that factor by itself? All right. That C1 minus C2 is on the numerator. I need to get to the numerator. What are some ideas? What do you think might help get that C1 by itself? Multiply by 4. Very good. So what will happen when I do that? When I multiply by 4, when I multiply by 4? These guys will cancel, right? So that will give me 4D over A equals C1 minus C2. Remember, your goal is still to solve for C1. So we're going to add C2 to both sides. These cancel, so we finally get that C1 equals 4D over A plus C2. Questions here? Other ways of writing, other ways of writing the same thing. Absolutely. Correct me if I'm wrong, but on the final we took out the choose all, and they're just for these they're just multiple choice. Correct. So on your confidence subjects you have the choose all, but on the final exam they reverted to multiple choice, so you only have to choose one. But let's do one other way just so that we get practice with this because you have to do it anywhere for your competency check. Another way to show this is to get on number here. And if you think of this, what's your common denominator, you think? It's, there you have a 1, you have an A. So it has to be A. Typically, what you do is you multiply this guy by 1, right? And this guy by A. You guys remember that? So if you do that, if you get a common denominator, A, then this is 4B plus a c2 over a. So that's another way to write that problem. It's possible, yeah, it's possible that they show you this way, that they show you this way instead. So it doesn't mean that the other versions are not there, it's just that you won't have to choose more than one, that there will only be one correct one. And you guys know, of course, that you, can, you can also flip the order on this because the addition is commutative, right? So another way of writing this would be C2 plus 4D over A it would also be okay. More questions on this one? No? I have another one that's close to this one. So this one is very similar. It says solve 4H. It's not on your packet, so you're going to have to write this one down. And it's V equals H pi R squared. Okay. So again, help me identify. What are the operations here? This is all multiplication. If I want to isolate H, what can I do? Divide by pi and by R squared. Okay, so that I'll cancel the pi out because any number divided by itself is 1, even if it's pi. Any R squared divided by itself is 1. So we get that H equals V over pi R squared. Let's talk about other ways to write that. Do you know what commutative means? You guys talked about commutative property in your class? Commutative means that 
also location can be split on an order. So can addition. So another way to write this would be r squared h. That's also correct. Okay. I'm sorry. Can't read my own handwriting. R squared pi. Okay. All right, is division commutative? Division is not commutative. So if you see one of the choices that has pi r squared over v, that's not correct. Division cannot be flipped around like that. Okay. I think those are the really the two ways to write these problems. Okay, more word problems. Valise can travel 270 miles on 10 gallons of gas. How many miles can she travel on 15 gallons of gas? What does that sound like? Proportion, yeah. So I'm going to set it up one way. You're, the way you set it up may be different than this, but we'll get the same answer. Okay? So I like to do miles over gallon and then miles or a gallon. So she travels 270 miles on 10 gallons of gas. I don't know how many miles she travels on 15 gallons of gas. No matter what way you set it up, we should have the same cross product here. So if I multiply these two guys together and these two guys together, we should have the same cross product. So that would be 270 times 15 equals 10x. I'm going to be lazy like Professor Barnett and ask you guys to multiply that for me. 4,050. Thank you. And she already did this for me, so I'll just double check it. Any questions so far there? No. And we divide both sides by 10. And this part we can do by ourselves, right? That's pretty easy to divide this by 10. The zeros just cancel. So we get the x equals 405. Now 405 what? Miles. Good. Does that answer make sense? Is it reasonable? Yeah. Why? More miles, more miles. Yeah, basically. Okay. Do you guys know how to set up different ways of, of writing the same proportion? Have you done this in class before? So some people could do 10 gallons over 270 miles. So instead of miles per gallon like I did, we're doing gallons per mile here. 15 gallons over X miles. This is also a correct answer. Look at the cross products. What are the cross products here? 270 times 15 is 10 times x, so the same cross product. In our old final exam, we used to make you guys pick all the possible proportions work. Not in this final exam anymore. <laughs> it's okay, we made it a lot harder with other stuff. <laughs> 19? Another radical one. Okay, we did the square root of 12 already, right? Did we do that one or was it 20? Yeah, we did that one. So we already know that the factors of 12 that are perfect squares are 4 and 3, and that the square root of 4 is 2. So when we multiply this out, this becomes 6a squared, square root of 3. Did I lose anybody there? Square root of 12? No? Okay. Square root of 74 might be a little tougher. What are some factors of 74? What do I know about 74? It's even, so that means that it's divisible by 2. 2 and 37. 37 is a prime number. So there are no other factors of 74, well, except 1 and 74. So we keep it. The square root of 74 cannot be simplified. How about the square root of a square? That's just A. So that's going to come down. The 
squared, seven for state and side. The square root of a squared was a, and there was an a already out there. So let's multiply that out. So what's an a times an a? That's a two a, right? A squared. Okay, these are like terms, so I can add these together. Yeah? This guy and this guy, can I add them together? No, they're not like radical. So for us to be able to add them together, not only do I need the same variable, same power, but same radical. So that's it. That's my final answer. Okay, Ron's computer monitor has a height of 14 inches with a diagonal measurement of 26 inches. How many inches wide is a rectangular screen? So the screen's rectangular. Has a height of 14 inches, a diagonal measurement. You guys know this, right? That computer screens, the screens are measured diagonally, usually, 26 inches. So they want to know how many inches wide is it. So they want to know this width right here. What does this look like to you? It's a triangle. And it's specifically a right triangle. What do we use for that? Pythagorean. And it's a squared plus b squared equals c squared. What are the a, b, and c numbers here? A, B, the legs triangle. Good. Who's your teacher? Whoever said that? Nah. <laughs> These are the legs, and C is the hypotenuse. Good. So we have 14 inches squared plus, we don't know the width. You can call it W, you can call it B, it doesn't matter. And we know the hypotenuse is 26. Okay. Square 14 and 26. What do we get when we do that? 14 squared is 196. Anybody know 26 squared? 676. Okay. Go ahead and subtract one. I say the b squared term, so we're going to subtract 196 from both sides. Okay, so that's going to give me the b squared equals 180. How do I get b by itself? Square root of both sides. So you guys know why that works? You guys know that when you have a number squared, and then you take the square root, the squared and the square root cancel each other out because they're inverses. Yeah, so you just get b. So you get b equals the square root of 480. All right, that's all sorts of fun, the square root of 480. How do we simplify that? Any thoughts? You can try to figure out what are some factors 480. 2 and 240. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going. 48 and 10. Right, that was 480. Eventually, you're going to get to 16 and 30. And so, how I like to do this is, and this doesn't work for everybody, so I can't guarantee you'll like this. I do my factor three. Everybody knows how to do factor three? Yeah. So one way to do this, and it's a, long, a little bit of a long way, but it still works, is you write all your factors out. The factors of 480 are 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. Did I get all of them? Two, 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 five. One, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five. Three and five. I got all my factors, right? 
and he looks for pairs. So this pair comes out, this pair comes out. I'm running out of space here. So that's one pair of twos that came out, another pair of twos that came out, and then inside the square root symbol, I'm left with 30, 30. So that's four square roots of 30. On your final exam, you don't have a calculator, so that's all you can do on your final exam. Realistically, if you're looking for the length of a monitor, you don't want a square root, so you would run into a calculator and get that four square root of 30 is approximately, I have this written down, 21.9 inches. Okay. Good there. How many was I going to do? Do you want to do factoring? Yeah, I want you to do factoring. There's 30. Yeah, got eight left, so you can do it. Good. Okay. Can you hear me on the computer? Can you hear me on? I know you guys can hear me, right? All right. Make sure my pen is working. My pen is working. Okay. So we're looking at this one. Um, it says fact factor completely, and we talked about the flow chart earlier. The first thing we're always supposed to look for as well. Say it again. This. Well, yes, is it in descending order? And this one isn't quite, right? But when, when we're looking for descending order, we're talking more about our quadratic, the ones that have the x squared, so on and so forth. Just by the, I'm looking, y to the 50th, y to the 55th, y to the 15th. That's not our typical trinomial, right? So what kind of thing should we look for other than is it in order? The GCF. So I have 30. 14 and 24, what number do they have in common? Two. I'm going to look over here for a second, too. Okay, I have y to the 50th, y to the 55th, and y to the 15th. What do they have in common? y to the 15th. So we're always going to pick the what exponent? The smallest one. Okay, so I have y to the 15th, and then what about my s's? S to the 6th, okay. So now that I actually found my GCF, what do I need to do with it? I need to factor, which means I'm going to do what operation? Divide. So a lot of students, um, you know, they like to do this stuff in their head, but me, even as an instructor, I just take a couple seconds and just actually show myself doing the division by the GCF. It all, I mean, really what you're doing is you're saving yourself a headache from making a simple mistake by doing it in your head. Uh, so my answer, obviously, I'm going to have my GCF written in the front. So I'm just going to kind of come down here a little bit. And from my division, I'm going to obviously get how many terms after I divide? How many terms am I going to be left with? I'm going to get here, here, and here. And they're all going to go inside the parentheses, right? So what is 30 divided by 2? 15, what happens to the y's? How many? So it's 50 minus the 15, which gives me the 35. And what about my S's? There's going to be two left. What sign should I bring down? Plus. I mean, technically, it's a positive 14 divided by a positive 2. So I'm going to get a positive term here. So I'm going to get 7Y what? 40. And what happens to the S's? They cancel. gives me 0. What does cancel mean? One. Okay, very good. What's my next sign going to be? Plus 24 divided by 2. 12. What happens to the y's? And the s's. So I'm just going to bring in my. Let's get a little bit closer. How do I check this? Distribute. I should be able to distribute back. And if my answer is right, I should get the original, right? 
Um, another way to kind of just check yourself, I'm just quickly looking 15, 7, and 12. I can see that they don't have a common factor, so I can be confident that I took out the largest number in the beginning. Okay. You guys have any questions about this one? Okay. What about this one? What's going on here? What's always the first thing we should look for anyway? GCF, do you see anything in common here? No. So what are the next questions you need to ask yourself? Um, well, that would kind of be like looking for the GCF, right? Is it in descending order? Well, they both have a square. There's no common factor. What's the next question? How many what? How many terms do I have? I don't have four terms, so I'm just not grouping. I don't have three terms, so I know it's not one of the trinomial problems. I have how many? Two terms with a what in the middle? Minus sign. So anybody know the name of this one? Difference of squares. And it, it's exactly what it sounds like. The difference of squares, so the difference is the minus sign of squares basically means I can take the square root of both of those terms. So yes, there's two terms. Yes, there's a minus sign. And yes, I can take the square root. So yes, it's the difference between two squares. What do I know about my answer when it's a difference of two squares? There's going to be a plus and a minus. There's going to be one plus and one minus. And what else? What's the square root of the first term? Five what? Z. And what's the square root of the second one? Eight X. Okay. What's the significance of having one plus and one minus? Why is that so important? They cancel each other out. If they had two pluses or two minus signs, I would end up with a trinomial when I foiled. But this one, if you, just so you can make sure you see it, when I FOIL this, I get the 25z squared, right? Here's minus 40xz. This would be plus 40xz and then minus 64x squared. This cancels out because there's one plus and one minus. If they were both the same sign, it would never cancel. I would never get back to the original. You guys good with that? Move on to the next one. All right. What about this one? Is there a GCF? Almost. Some of them, right? But not all of them. It has, all of the terms have to have it in order for it to be a GCF. So how many terms are there? Four. Is that what you are going to say? You're going to factor by grouping because there are four terms. I know it's a grouping problem because there are four terms. Um, and I kind of summarize grouping as taking the GCF three times. That's essentially what you're doing. Okay. You're going to take it once on this side here. You're going to take it a second time over here. And then at the end, we're going to compare and take the GCF a third time. That's essentially what it is. So on the left-hand side, what's in common? A Y. So when I take out the Y, which basically means I'm dividing by Y, what is left? R plus K. So whatever I take out on the right-hand side, I better get what after I divide? R plus K. So what's in common on the right-hand side? B. Divide by B. Divide by B. Again, you see the B's cancel. I'm left with R plus K. So I found the GCF once here, which was Y. I found it a second time here, which was B. Now for the third one, I'm saying, okay, what is the common factor between the two sides? R plus K. And again, if you just kind of show yourself, we don't usually show it all the time, but if you show yourself dividing by what's in common, you'll see the part that's left is the rest of your answer. Questions? No? You good? Any questions online, Hector? No? Okay. Okay, so this one says solve, but we still have to do what? Factor. We still have to factor first. So they're putting the instruction solve, but you have to know that in order for me to solve it, I have to factor first. So the same questions. Is there a GCF? No. Is it in order? Yes. How many terms are there? Three. So um, I heard Ms. Barnett referring to it as, is it the Columbian method or is it the easier one? It's the Columbian method because there is a number in the front. And I'll try to show another way for you. Okay. So um, for those of you who, and again, there's more than one way to factor. I kind of believe that this way is the easiest one where you take this term and you multiply it by itself 
and the last one. So you get 36 x squared. You don't mess with the middle at all, minus 18. And we'll deal with the equal zero at the end, right? We're just worrying about factoring right now. Um, the next step would be, what is the square root of 36x squared, 6x, and 6x? And what am I going to do with the signs? I'm going to bring this first one down, right? And a positive times a negative is a negative. Right here, the fact that I have 1 plus and 1 minus tells me when I do my factors of 18, am I looking for something that adds or subtracts to give me 7? Subtracts. When these signs are different, I want something that subtracts to give me 7. So I got 1 times 18, 2 and 9, 3 and 6, anything else? So which one of these subtract to give me 7? And I'm always going to put the largest one first. And that makes sense because my middle term is positive. So, of course, I want my larger number with the plus sign, right? Am I finished, though? No. Since I changed the problem in the beginning by multiplying by 6, what do I have to do at the end? Divide by 6. Am I going to divide by the whole number 6? No. What am I dividing by? Factors of 6, 3 and 2, and obviously 3 times 2 is 6. So my first binomial ends up being 2x plus 3, 3x minus 1, and now of course I have to deal with the actual solve part. I didn't even solve yet. All that was just factoring. How do I solve this? Each of them, right? So I'm going to have 2x plus 3 equals 0 and 3x minus 1 equals 0. So for the first equation, I'm going to minus 3. I get 2x equals negative 3. And how do I get x by itself? Divide by 2. So for the first one, I have x equals negative 3 over 2. That's one answer. And for this one, add 1. Robert has left the building. OK. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the names. 3x equals 1. Divide by 3. Divide by 3. x equals 1 third. Okay, now for my friends that don't like the Columbia method, let's take it all the way back here. So there's a number in the front. I still have to do the six times the three to get the eighteen, right? So this is the other method if this if you don't like it. Okay, so I would still kind of go through the motions of I need to change a couple of things, but essentially the eighteen method is changing this trinomial to a grouping problem, changing it to four terms. So I would still need the factors of 18. And essentially what I would do is I would rewrite 7x with two terms instead of just one. So the same numbers I used here, 9 and 2, would be the same numbers I would use over here. Because a plus 9x and a minus 2x, in fact, is still 7x, right? So now all I did was change it to a grouping problem. So if I look here, 6x squared and 9x, what do they have in common? 3x. So when I take out 3x, what's left inside my parentheses? 2x plus, somebody said it, 3. And on the right-hand side, what's in common? Negative 2. Whenever something leads off negative, you want to make sure you take that negative sign out. And 2 and 18 have 2 in common. So when I divide by negative 2, I hope that I get something over here. I don't see it happening. Did I miss something? Vicky, did I miss something? Something happened. Oh, did I change it right here? I don't know what I did. Oh, okay. I see what you mean. I actually wrote it. I should have kept it here. Now I see what you're saying. Okay. Let me go back. So this whole side was negative 2x minus 3. So really, they only had negative 1 in common. There we go. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so in the habit of doing it the other way. Okay. So I have 3x. 2x plus 3, and this side was negative 1, and 2x plus 3. And then when I compare the sides, I get 2x plus 3 and 3x minus 1 
which if you come back over here, was the same exact thing. I really do, I mean, you can tell out of habit, I haven't even done this one in a while. I really like this one better. But if you like changing it to four terms, obviously you still get the same answer. Okay. Say again. Yeah, I mean, and, and that makes a difference too. If this is 49 and this is, you know, something, I'm going to be there all day looking for, so sometimes it depends. Um, sometimes trial and error may be the way to go, but I, again, that one, especially during a test, takes a lot of time. So um, these go straight to the answer right away. Okay. Any questions about that one? Okay. Let's see what else we have here. Simplifying radicals. You guys did a little bit of this earlier. This is probably a very simple one. It's just one thing to simplify. Um, uh, some teachers did it different. I know this Mr. O'Farrell, he was writing two square root symbols. I, I think I'm kind of lazy. I just kind of write one big one. I know I can't take the square root of 18, but I know there are some factors of 18 that I can, which is what? 9 and 2. So I would literally just write it like this. X to the seventh is not the way I want it to be, so what should I break this into? X six and then the leftover one because it's easy to take the square root of an even number exponent. And W to the fourth is already even. So literally what I do is I just kind of go down the line. Can I take the square root of this? Can I do this? And take them out. Can I take the square root of nine? Yes, and it is three. Can I take the square root of two? Now, what about x to the sixth? x to the third. Can I take the square root of x? Can I take the square root of w to the fourth? What's left? What didn't I cross out? Questions? Straightforward, right? Um, I do the, you know, I mix it up. Sometimes I do, you know, like what I saw you guys doing this earlier. No. Which, you know, all, all the same, you can see that that ends up being what's left, just depending on how you like to look at it. Any questions on this one? No? What are we going to do here? At the distribute, there's a set of parentheses, and I have this term in the front. I'm going to distribute. So when I multiply radicals, what do I got to kind of remember? Do I just multiply everything? The inside and the outside. So I have a 3 on the outside here. What's on the outside for this term? Nothing, which is kind of like a 1. So 3 times 1 is 3. And I got 2 and 10 inside the radical, which is going to give me 20. I'll do the next one. I have 3 and negative 5 on the outside. So I'm going to get negative 15. And then I have 2 and 2 on the inside. And now I'm just going to simplify. Um, I can see right away this one, the square root of 4 is 2, so I'm going to multiply 2 by negative 15 and get minus 30. And the 20 obviously can be broken up into what two numbers? Two factors. 4 and 5, 5 and 4, you can put them backwards or either way. The square root of 4 is 2. 2 times 3 gives me 6, so I have 6 square root of 5 minus 30. Do we write it the other way or we write it like this? Okay. Questions? Nothing? You sure? Ooh, yay. Any questions? Okay. So it says solve. So the same way you would solve an equation when there's an equal sign, you're going to solve this the same way. There's one rule that we have to remember about this, though, when we're solving. Anybody know what it is? When you divide or or multiply by a negative number, we flip the sign. So just pay attention to as we're working it, if we actually ever divide or multiply by negative, that's when we'll flip it. Um, I'm a creature of habit. I like my variables on the left-hand side. I don't care if it makes it negative or not. I like my variable on the left, especially if I'm going to graph this later. So I would actually take my 4 to the other side by doing minus 4. I would get 14x. Is that standard equal to 26x? And what happens right here? The 20 and the negative 4. Plus 16. 
sorry, my four looks kind of ugly. All right, there you go. And again, I like my x on the left-hand side, so I would do minus 26x, minus 26x. So how many x's? I know it's going to be a minus, right? Minus what? 12. Less than or equal to 16. Am I going to end up flipping my sign? Yes, because right here to get the variable alone, the coefficient is negative. So when I divide by that negative, I'm definitely going to flip it. Now there's a couple things I need to do here before I can graph. One of them is simplify this fraction, right? 4 and 12 have what number in common? Bigger, 4. So it would work, but then I'd have to do it again, right? That's okay. So let's make this a little bit smaller by simplifying. Now, it is simplified, but since I actually have to graph this, does leaving it improper like this help me? No, not really. So how would I write this as a mixed number? Negative 1 and 1 third. Okay. Now I can graph it. I don't know how to graph 4 thirds without changing it to a mixed number. Okay. So we got a number line. We have 0, 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2. Where is negative 1, 1 third on this number line? In between what two numbers? Negative 1 and negative 2. I'd say like eh, right about there, right? I'm estimating. It's right about there. It's not quite halfway. It's, no. Now, if x is greater than that number, greater than or equal to, what am I going to do here? What kind of symbol should I put? A closed circle or a bracket. Okay, they, they are the same. You should recognize both. I'm just going to go ahead and use the bracket. And if x is greater than this, it has to be everything to the right. What if it wasn't or equal to? What if it was just x is greater than? What would I have done then? Parentheses or open circle. Very good. Any questions? No? Are you sure? Let me see. Ooh, find the y-intercept for the line represented by this equation. Okay, so what's the magic number for intercepts? Zero. If I'm looking for the y-intercept, what should be zero? X. What if I'm looking for the x-intercept? All right. So since I'm looking for the y-intercept, x is going to equal zero. So I'm literally plugging in zero. Well, anything times zero is zero, so that goes by back. Eight y equals negative eight. How do I get y by itself? Divide by eight. Divide by eight. What does y equal? Negative one. Now this is great, but I'm pretty sure that the test wants you to write your answer as a point. I think. Does it? Sometimes, Sometimes right? So if I had to write this as a point, obviously x was 0, and we found y to be negative 1. So this would be my answer as a point, or ordinate or pair, or ordered pair, or any of those, any of those terminologies. You guys have any questions about that? No? You sure? How about this one? Now, I see a lot of students, especially on the computer, for whatever reason, instead of just taking the equation and drawing a graph on their paper, they, they, you know, they try to, like, match it. Take two seconds on your scrap paper and make a graph and then look for your match. You're, you know, you're in only in competition with yourself. You're not trying to beat anybody out of the room or just draw the, draw the equation yourself. So I'm not even going to look at the choices. I don't really care about the choices. I'm going to go straight to my graph that was going to be so like sloppy because I don't have a ruler or anything. And if I'm going to graph this, is this equation already in a form that's really nice for me? Yes. What form is that? Y equals mx plus b, which is called what? Slope intercept form. So what is my intercept? Negative 4. So I know that my line is going to cross the y-axis at, that's my starting point. I also noticed that my slope is positive, so I know my line is going to go up to the right. So I'm going to go up 1, over 2, up 1, over 2. 
Draw my line. First of all, is this guy positive? No, this is a negative slope right here. Not that one. Is he positive? Yes, he's positive. He is negative. Okay, can't be that one. Which one is it? Because they both cross at my negative 4. Yeah, I'm thinking it's this one. Because my t right here, this one crosses at 2. My line isn't anywhere near there. So I'm going to pick this one. So right away, we were able to eliminate two choices just by looking at whether the slope was positive or negative. Go ahead and eliminate some choices right off the bat. Okay. You guys have any questions about that? No? Are there any more after this? Oh, that's it. Okay. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, the Math Depot is packed, so watch the video. Okay. Okay, in about two hours, this recording will be on the Math Depot's webpage if you want to share it with your friends or watch it again or rewind it or any of those things.